Welcome to Mr. Brown's Basement, a channel devoted to sharing the craft of repairing, restoring, and modifying vintage electronic gear, and other random stuff. This Firestone 4A49 chairside radio was picked up near Hamilton, Ontario, and is the first Firestone chairside I have seen in this style. Chairside radios were made from the late 1930s to the 1950s, but fell out of fashion as radios became less a piece of furniture and more an appliance. This coincided with the transition from radios in ornate wooden cabinets to molded plastic cabinets. This chairside radio was probably made in or around 1949. Radios such as this were sold by Firestone to promote their core business, which was automotive tires. This wasn't unique to Firestone. Other companies, such as B.F. Goodrich and Western Auto, also used radios as part of their marketing strategy. Firestone radios were made for them by well-established manufacturers, such as Stuart Warner, Belmont, and Emerson. I have not determined who made this set. As you see, the cabinet has a compartment which would originally have housed a phonograph. That would have provided clues to where and by whom this radio was made. Unfortunately, the phonograph was not included. Being that this was from the Canadian branch of the Firestone Company, I expected the radio chassis to be made in Canada. While I can't tell for sure, I'm doubting that now. First, Canadian sets often use Robertson socket head screws, and this radio doesn't have any. Second, I would expect the speaker to have been made domestically, as there were many local manufacturers and suppliers. This speaker, which looks original, is labeled Rolla and was made in England. Rolla bought Celestian in the 1940s. Yes, that's the same Celestian speaker company that is still around today. The radio chassis itself is nothing special. It's a typical All American 5, 5 tube transformerless super heterodyne radio with 1940s style octal base tubes. This label shows who made the cabinet. After some googling, I discovered a listing for the J.T. Stone Cabinet and Furniture Manufacturing Company. I couldn't find out much about the company except that it was located in Montreal, Canada. Repair access is very awkward to say the least. The cabinet must be rotated speaker down. Then the speaker, which is mounted with the speaker fabric, must be removed and then the chassis, which is on its own shelf, must be detached from the cabinet by removing screws. The lack of airflow in the cabinet may have contributed to the severe deterioration of the paint on the dial face, but it's hard to say for sure. The chassis is in fair condition with some corrosion. Someone has attempted to surface it before. The dial string is broken. The dial shows heat damage from the two nearby power tubes, and there is serious paint loss or damage on the dial pointer. It's unclear how and where the dial lamp was mounted. My plan for repair for the set will include number one, test for and replace any weak tubes. Two, replace all paper and electrolytic capacitors with modern units. Three, replace the power cord, install a line fuse. Four, replace the dial string and adjust the dial. Tweak the IF and oscillator if necessary, keeping in mind that I don't have the alignment instructions. 5. Check the speaker cone for tears. Obtain and replace the speaker fabric, which currently is somewhere between grey and plum, with something more acceptable and closer to the original. 6. Have a compatible dial face printed. Install and re-implement a dial light, possibly with LEDs. And 7. Connect in a CD player because I can't foresee using this unit to listen to music from vinyl discs. I always begin by testing all the tubes. Testing the five tubes, and it looks like two of them need to be replaced. Electrolytic and paper capacitors are typically replaced without question. Mica and ceramic capacitors are left alone unless there is physical damage or deterioration. Inside, nothing special. This capacitor here has been replaced, the main electrolytic. 150 
two sections, 40 and 40. Okay, just a regular firecracker capacitor. Eight paper capacitors, look like Canadian manufacture. An electrolytic over there, another one that has not been replaced. And these are mica mold, probably their paper. We'll take a look at them later, but nothing out of the ordinary. This must be a tone control here. This is just a selector between phono and AM. And this is volume and power switch. Note to anybody who likes to power on radios without checking them over first. Probably not such a good idea. No, not a good idea. This is broken too. Could make for some fairly exciting fireworks if this was ever plugged in and touched both the contact in the receptacle and the chassis at the same time. No question that these pink capacitors, the ones I referred to as mica mold, are replacements because the manufacturer never would have soldered them in like that. No way. That's a replacement. And at that end too, that's a replacement. With uh, solder filled lugs like that, I'm not going to use the solder braid. I'll use a solder sucker. I've spent a few hours on this. I've replaced all the electrolytic capacitors. This one, and there was one hiding in there somewhere. It's now a radial capacitor. All but three resistors I tested were within tolerance. I replaced the power receptacle right there for the turntable. And this terminal strip was going to nothing. I suspect that's the antenna. So it's now got an antenna lead on it. This wire had been left by the prior repairer for the dial lamp, it's going to go. The line cord is the first place that a fire or an electrocution could happen, so it should always be replaced. It was cheaper to buy a pre-made extension, which I will use after I lop off the end, and then insert a fuse, and then we're almost ready to power up. Here I have got the fuse, mounted the electrolytic so it's out of the way. On the top, I fixed this where the insulation was so old it was cracked and it was beginning to short with the chassis. And that's not going to happen anymore. And new wires that are going to go to the speaker. I think I'm just about ready to test it. I've got a meter to watch my B+. It shouldn't climb to about more than 100 and 40. The electrolytic is rated at 160, so as long as it doesn't exceed 160 for any length of time, it should be okay. The antenna is just flying over here. Not going to do anything with the antenna yet. Just get it out of the way. Speaker is connected and it should be ready to power up. I am not using an isolation transformer. This chassis is not actually live. It's not connected to the line. I've got probably about 100 volts going in, 111 on B+. It's drawing 0.2 amps, and nothing so far. Guess what? I guess it works. done some repair to this. It's not in great shape, but I think uh, it will survive. You can tell how browned it is from the heat. And for this, I think I'm going to use a dropping resistor, 10k, 2 watts, a piece of LED tape, and that will be my light. I'm going to grab the power off uh, B plus, B plus one, which is on the first capacitor. 
right there. These are typical ways of wiring up a 35Z5. This one with no dial light and this one with a dial light. This is how this one is wired. What I've done is connected the anode directly to the line and removed the 41 ohm resistor that wired through the center tap of the filament. This simplifies the circuit to a textbook 35Z5 circuit without a bulb dial light. After playing with the dial string for a couple of hours, I decided that the one that came with it was probably not the original. It wasn't long enough. So I improvised and made up a new dial string, which seems to work. And I'm just waiting for the acrylic paint to dry on the pointer. Nothing special, just dollar store acrylic. Already looks better. And it works. Something I had never tried before. A nice even lighting. And uh, the dial string works. Bad reception with our antenna. Before I replace the speaker fabric, I'd like to take off the speaker and see about the tears in the paper cone. This is not a difficult thing to repair so long as the rips are there. If they're actually at the rim, then you can't repair it. It won't sound right. Before you start, don't forget to remove any dust that may be living inside the speaker. Like there. Don't want to keep that as a collector's item. There's a rip there, and there, and there. I need some white glue, just generic white glue. Don't get the dollar store white glue because it's too watery. And Take paper towel and split it into its plies and saturate one of the plies with glue. That's all I need, one ply. You don't cut it into like a patch. Uh, a blob is a better shape. Push it up from behind so it grabs as much of the paper as possible. If there's any paper which is sticking out, it's going to vibrate at low frequencies and sound awful. Whether you use a brush or your finger, keep the motion going outward so it makes a smooth seam between the edge of the patch and the cone. You also don't want to have any air bubbles. It looks like, given the kind of tear, that I may have to patch the bottom of the speaker in a couple places. The glue is allowed to dry overnight. On some patches, like this one, that's a really good patch. Some patches, I didn't add enough glue, that is, to the bottom. So these patches aren't as good. It's not like they're going to fail, but they are not adhering as well. Works, and it gets quite loud. Then there seems to be a lot of interference. If I go to phono, done. There's almost no hum at all. I think Here's the speaker cloth that came with the radio. It's not original. It's sort of a plum gray. Uh, I think it's hideous. On the back, it looks gray. I don't even know if this is speaker fabric or, or what it is, but it's ugly. Alright, all the staples are out. And that really reveals this. These go up and down. This is the pattern I've chosen. I think that's going to be a lot sharper. I just have to, have to iron it first to take out the folds.
Here's the dial face that came with the radio. It is not usable. Here's the replacement dial face. It's the original glass plus a piece of film which was printed on an inkjet printer it's been laminated to the underside of the glass. What I'm going to do is put that into a sandwich with another piece of glass so that it is protected. The original face was taped onto the wood. I've attached this one with silicone sealant. Now that the unit is together, let's see how it looks with it off and with power applied. I was most curious to see how it would look with the LEDs illuminating the dial face from behind, especially at night, and see how it sounds. Now, base running is a lost start in the buzz. Not a lost start, it's just atrocious in the major leagues. I've made a piece of wood here that fits through like that and there's a small spot for the wires to come through. After trying a DVD player in the compartment where the record player used to go, I'm not liking it. First of all, even though it's the smallest one that I could find, it doesn't fit very well. And second, I don't listen to that many CDs, so I have a better solution. Instead, I put in an Apple Airport Express and I can stream directly from my computer or from my telephone. I'm quite pleased how this project turned out. I suppose the only change I would make would be to get a shielded matching transformer so there would be less hum in the output. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please consider giving me a thumbs up and subscribing to Mr. Brown's Basement for more interesting and unusual videos.